My name's Tiffany. And I'm Wendy. And welcome to Rogue and Wicked. photo shoot for the podcast so we can add some uh, some eye candy to the website. <laughs> Spice is nice. Did you get Spice it. <laughs> Did you get those sexy thigh highs I sent you? Oh yeah, I did actually. They're really hot, so I'm hoping uh they work well with the the whole theme we're going for. I don't want to like let anybody know about it in case this comes out before the pictures do. So <laughs> what about you? What have you been up to? Oh our house is mostly green now. Um we have solar panels on our roof and it's been a perfect summer for it. But we're also on top of a hill, so it's super advantageous to have it. Um, and we, we actually got our first quote-unquote bill, and guess how much it was? What? Zero. Oh, sweet. You don't have to pay nothing for that? Well, we had to pay for the p- solar panels, but the way that it works out is if we don't use too much electricity, we can actually financially profit off of while in comparison to what would be our electricity bill, paying for the solar panels is cheaper in the first place, so it's financially advantageous in that regard, as well as it being green. But on top of that, if we're frugal with how much energy we use, we can actually receive a check in the mail instead of sending one out. Yeah, that is good. But speaking of going green here, oh, I have yeah. um I have a, a serial killer that is got a cool he has a way cooler name than how cool he actually is, I'll tell you that right oh, now. Oh, I this know dude's... you don't like him. <laughs> oh my god, he's a total nerd and he actually kinda reminds me of uh, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, because of how much of a frigging like unassuming nerdy guy this dude was. So we're gonna be talking about the green river killer. He was uh, pretty notorious, but wasn't publicized upon that much, even even during his capture, which was a long time later. But we're going to start off in uh, 1982 in Kent, you know, Washington. The body of a young woman was found under the Peck Bridge on Merker Street, or Meeker Street, I think it was. Yeah, Meeker Street. She floated in from the Green River. She was bound and tangled with rope. She was white and estimated to be about 5'4 and about 140 pounds. She wore a white trimmed blue and white striped shirt, white tennis shoes, and unhemmed jeans. She had identifying tattoos. Although none at the time came forward to identify her, the King County Medical Examiner noted that she had a vine around her heart on her left arm. She had two tiny butterflies above her breasts and a cross with a vine around it on her shoulder, a Harley Davidson motorcycle insignia on her back, and the unfinished outline of a unicorn on her lower abdomen. So this chick was tatted. Mm -hmm. And she seemed pretty cool because I like all those things. Yeah, I was going (laughs) to say, I like motorcycles, vines, butterflies, and I mean, she's definitely a unicorn. And a unicorn. I mean, come on. I love unicorns. We just did a TikTok in those. (laughs) But I'm sad because it was found on a person's body and not on a living human being. But the medical examiner noted that the tattoos may have a gang affiliation. And the King County Police interviewed some gang members, but none of them admitted to even knowing who she was. She had been placed in the river and was strangled with her own panties. Later, a tattoo artist identified her tattoos and came forward with an identification. Her name was Wendy Lee Caulfield, and she lived in Pulleyup, Washington, and she was 16 years old. Oh my gosh, she had that many tattoos at 16, and she yes. was found dead at 16? That's... Whew. I know, she was really young. 
and it's really sad. Um, the paper reported that she was between the ages of 20 to 25, but with decomposition, it was easy to make the mistake because of the bloating and degrading of the organic matter of her body. Hmm. When her mother was located, she said, I kind of expected it. She worked as a prostitute, and I think she was killed by a John. I know that that there's a life that she chose for herself, and we taught her the best we could. So her mother said that she was a good country girl, but she became troubled when they moved to Auburn in Kent, Washington. Her family struggled growing up, and they didn't have much money. Things had gotten even worse when her mother and father had divorced. She was left to raise Wendy and her siblings as a single mother, and at one point they lived in a tent and sold blackberries so they could buy food. Wendy dropped out in junior high and turned to alcohol. She had become pregnant at 16 and gave the baby up for adoption. She enrolled in the Kent Continuation School and looked older than she was. She was a chronic runaway, and she stole $140 of food stamps from a neighbor. One night, she came home disheveled and said a man had raped her while she was hitchhiking. That was the norm in the 60s. 60s, 70s, and 80s to go hitchhiking. Um, but she was described as a person who wanted more than what she had and took terrible chances to get it. The last sighting of Wendy was when she slipped out of Reman Hall a week before her corpse was found in the Green River. She was listed as a runaway and no one was actively seeking her until two boys stumbled across to her body under a bridge. The SeaTac Strip was what the locals referred to when they t- were talking about the Pack Highway that ran from Seattle Tacoma Airport, now now referred to as the International Parkway. There were little motels called cabin camps along the highway and marginal hotels that featured male and female exotic dancers. A lot of runaways lived in these seedy hotel rooms and worked out of them along the strip as sex workers. Travelers from all over the country would pick up dates on the SeaTac Strip, which made it easy to make a quick buck. Drugs and pimps flooded the streets, so with that, sex workers also flooded the streets. With so many Johns and travelers coming in and out and made it easy for a predator to come and go without being seen, things quieted down for a while until August 12, 1982. That's when the body of Deborah Bonner was found. She was easy to identify because her fingerprints were already in the police database. She had been arrested for offering sex for money twice. She was an active sex worker who moved along the SeaTac Strip. She was last seen alive July 25th, 18 days before her body was discovered. She left Three Bears Motel and told some friends that she was hoping to catch some dates and she was picked up and never seen again. Deborah was an exotic looking woman, slender, and grew up in Tacoma, Washington. She had two brothers and dropped out of school two years before graduating. She had trouble finding jobs because of her lack of education and even failed the Navy test, but still planned on getting her GED. She fell in love with a hobo sapien is what I like to call them. A man who lets a woman work to support him. You know, a fuckboy. That's interesting. I I actually just recently learned what a hobo sexual is. (laughs) Oh, no, Which Hobo is, Sapien. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying that term made me, you know, realize that this week I've learned two new terms. That <laughs> one to coincide with a hobo sexual, which is living with somebody and having sex with them to live for free. Yeah, yeah. Now that you got the hobo sapien too. Hobo man. sapien and hobo sexual. Okay, duly yeah. noted. Sorry for interjecting. I know, you're cool. It's, it's fine. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But yeah, the only way to like make that kind of money that she needed to support her and her boyfriend was to work on the streets. So her boyfriend had a newer model, Thunderbird. And they would travel often, but soon they discovered heroin. And once she became addicted, she couldn't get out. She told friends she was working on the circuit, but had been trying to turn her life around. She would check in regularly with her friends and family through collect calls. And the last time she spoke to her family was after her father had eye surgery on July 20th. She told him that she loved him, which is sad because I that was like, but it was nice that that was the last thing that he heard. Well, it's also a great, it's a great thing to be able to say during... Okay, go on, go on. Yeah, so her her boyfriend, right, he was also her pimp. He was stalking her at a local bar, and she told friends she owed him several thousand dollars. And she was scared because she didn't know how she was going to pay him back. She had reason to fear him because... He had been convicted of manslaughter when he shot and killed a man and spent five years in prison for the crime. Police didn't see any links between Deborah and Wendy's murder, so they focused on her boyfriend, Max Tackley. King County police kept an open mind and interviewed over 100 people on the strip. 
Anyone from servers to cocktail waitresses, bartenders, and taxi drivers. They even contacted Portland and Spokane to see if they had any unsolved cases of women who worked on the circuit. Three days later, a man, he was looking for antique bottles and trash that was floating in the Green River. He was on a rubber raft, and while looking along the bottom of the water, he squinted and was horrified at what he saw. Two fingers floated beneath the surface, and open eyes stared blankly up at the sky. At first he thought it was a mannequin, but it was too detailed to be a mannequin. It's never a mannequin. But he rode down the river a bit and signaled a passerby to call authorities. Dave Reichert and Sue Peters were the first responding officers to the scene. As he approached the Green River, it was evident that there was a second body in the river. As Detective was coming down the bank of the river to secure the scene, through this thick vegetation, he slipped and almost stepped onto the third body of another young woman. Oh, the, no. Yeah, dude. It was getting real down by the river. <laughs> Sorry. I wasn't Sorry. even joking but you know that's it was yes. it was getting real like the mm -hmm. first two women were weighted down by large rocks that were placed on their abdomen and breasts the third victim detectives thought the killer was spooked by a passerby and just left the body without carrying her all the way down to the water she was a biracial woman who looked to be in her mid-teens and had been strangled with her own shorts. The two other women were of African ethnicity and weighted down by rocks with signs of strangulation. The police requested radio silence during this time as to not alert media of what was ensuing at this point. The first victim was identified as Marcia Chapman through fingerprints. She was known by friends as tiny because of her small stature. She was beautiful with symmetrical features and pouty lips. She had three children, ages 3, 9, and 11, and supported them through sex work. She left her apartment on August 1st, 1982, and never returned. Police sketches of the other two women were drawn up because they still weren't identified. Two unidentified women had been raped and triangular-shaped stones were placed in their vaginas so tightly that they had to be surgically removed, as if somebody just jammed them up there. Mm. Yeah. Police think that the killer had a case of ED, you know, erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. and shoved the stones in there as a rape substitute. Soon after the two other victims were identified, the first was Cynthia Hines. That was a 17-year-old vibrant girl who went by the name Cookie. She was a sex worker on the SeaTac Strip with a pimp. She was last seen on the highway getting into a black Jeep with a male driver, and the pimp did not get the license plate number. She then rode off into the distance with no protection after that because, I mean, pimps, they only give you immediate protection in the moment. But right. as soon as you ride off with a John, that's it. I mean, they're not going to follow you into the bedroom, you know what I mean? Right, exactly. It gives them an, an idea... It's a false the, sense of security. Well, I mean, save for the fact that being able to identify who the prostitute left with. But then again, there's also them taking the risk of I identified, therefore I am an illegal pimp as well. For, well yeah, I mean, how many illegal people are going to be like, oh, hey, by the way, like my... My I saw that sex man. worker. Yes, exactly. That I run, you know, is like off with some dude, you know. It's still, still though, when somebody's, you know, the, from the murderer's perspective, it puts them a little bit. There's a little more liable, if not a lot more liability, when somebody can identify you. Yeah, that's true. But unless they think the way you and I just did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, sorry, go on. No, no, you're fine. So the woman found on the bank was finally identified after police published her picture in the newspaper. And finally, finally, family came forward. She was Opal Mills, barely 16 years old, with reddish hair and freckles. She had a big brother and mother and father who lived in East Hill outskirts of Kent, Washington. She was last seen by her mother three days before her body was found. She told her mother that she was going to go work and called home again in the early afternoon saying that she was at a phone booth in Angle Lake State Park. Opal wasn't going to work on the SeaTac Strip. She was going to paint houses with Cookie. She was a new friend of Opal's and Opal would run away from home from time to time but was not known to be a sex worker. She was just a regular girl with a bright smile, loved by her friends and family. Her brother said that she would get excited when she was little, you know, when, when she carried her little Care Bear lunchbox to kindergarten, but she called it a Hair Bear lunchbox, which I thought was kind of cute. She was like a tiny little peanut with a baby face, and her hair was braided into pigtails. 
That's what her brother said about her. Wow. Yeah. These are all babies so far. So it so seems well, Wendy much. was, well, Cookie was what, um, 17 with yeah. three children? And Wendy no, no, was that six. was Cynthia Hines. I th- oh, wait, yeah, yeah. Cynthia Hines is Cookie. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just and had a brain that, fart. That's all right. And so she, you know, she was a beautiful young girl. And then um, you had, so anyway, Deborah, the one with the, who, the sex worker with the pimp boyfriend who, with whom she owed money. And there's Wendy, who is 16, the other 17, 17 and 16. I mean, the only I mean, they're young. Out. Yeah, they're young. And none of the, I mean, and of course, they're all different races so far, too. Yeah, they are. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like there was a specific victim type here. Just female and young so far as the continuity speaks. Yeah, as, as, as of right now. So I'm going to mm-hmm. give you a little more information as we go along. Opal's older brother, he was always in charge of Opal, and he knew it was, like, his responsibility, so he took her everywhere with him. Even the drive-in movies where she would, like, hang out in the backseat when he was on a date. She talks about having tons of kids and buying her mother a house someday, which I thought was really sweet. She had a big heart and cared for others more than she did herself. She struggled with her weight and was always trying to slim down. She was boy crazy and wore a heart on her sleeve. She dropped out of school and went to a continuum school. The mystery is always remained though whether or not Opal dabbled in sex work because of her association with Cookie but it was believed that they were just friends and not co-workers. Well, so well was, did they paint together? Yeah they were painting the houses together that day. Okay. Supposedly. Right. So yeah. Allegedly. Okay. Dick Kraske didn't want the media finding out that there were now five bodies at the Green River and eager to find this monster he organized this Green River Task Force on August 16th, 19 1982. It consisted of 25 investigators from King County, the Seattle Police Department, the Tacoma Police Department, and the Kent Police Department. At the time, they thought that they were looking for more than one killer, being that they were all dumped either at the same time or within a day of two of each other. They were sure that the killer was watching the news because the body stopped showing up at the Green River after five bodies were found. So he's kind of like tipped off at that point and he stopped dumping them there. He had to take a break. Five people's a little conspicuous. Well, did he take a break <laughs> though? So let's Well, at least on. from that place. Yeah, yeah. Did. That's what I'm saying. He took a break from the Green River. Yep. The local police, yeah, the local police told the girls to get off the streets and get, and, and some of them were really afraid at this point. A lot of them weren't so they so some of them moved from the sea tax strip to the to portland and one sex worker said the killer the sex workers was a trick or tricks that moved from different places like the sex workers did he Hmm. couldn't he could be like anywhere so some of the girls thought that they would be able to tell who the killer was and ignored the advice in the news you know because they're like i know i know i could tell if the guy's a creepo you know what i mean Mm -hmm. So they kept working on the strip regardless of their fears and some had to be to keep up like with their drug drug habits and some just to provide for themselves and their children. So on January 21st, 1982, Leanne Wilcox was found face down in a weed patch, 380th and Military Road South. She was strangled and beaten to death. Leanne was described as a bright young teenager at age 13, was troubled and spent time in a group home. She was a runaway who would come and go to her mother's home. She had turned to sex work and her mother told her that as long as you live here, you are not welcome in our home, but our door is always open. My God, these so, women like, were so, yeah. so young. I mean, thir- 16 was already bothering me and 13 just makes it so much worse. Imagine full grown men driving cars and picking up these young girls. I just can't wrap my mind around it. I know. And like, it's a shame that like at 13, you're going to tr- kick your uh, kid out because she was doing sex work out of the house at 13 and yeah. say that as long as you live under my roof and you're doing this, you're not welcome here. But our door is always open if you decide to clean your life up. I mean, I could see that like with an 18 year old or 20 year old. Yeah, I can see that being an ultimatum. Because in it, 1982, as... as a 13 year old, you couldn't get a job. Exactly. I mean, that's almost, you have to do it now. A month later, Leanne's body was found. So I bet her mother was like kicking herself in her ass for that one. I'm not blaming her parents, but I'm kind of like annoyed that she would kick her daughter out on the street at age 13. I just thought that was really shitty. I mean, in a situation like that, therapy would be more useful. Yeah, but you gotta remember it's 1982. 
I don't think I knew anyone that went to therapy in 1982. I wasn't even well, born in 1982. I was going to say, that's, that's because we weren't alive to think about yeah, it. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you're, but you're right, those were, you know, colder times, uh, allegedly, yeah. uh, as far as we know. But still, 13 is incredibly young, and there had to have been some way to at least get through besides you have to financially support yourself in a situation where you're already attempting to financially support yourself, and this is the job that you've chosen, so here you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, could job. you be any more ca- callous, like, in that situation? Right, right, it just seems very sloppily handled, but again, you know, we're many years hence, and God knows how our parents feel now. Yeah, it is it is what it is. But mm-hmm. um, on January 29th, 1982, Virginia Taylor, 18 years old, headed for a bus to work. And she worked at a peep show in southwest Seattle. Despite her job as an exotic dancer, she was generally cautious, but she had occasionally hitchhiked to work. No one saw her get onto the number 20 bus that day. She was last seen two blocks from her sister's house. School kids found her body at the same day in the muddy field fully clothed and strangled so she was found by school kids in a muddy field strangled to death so like who knows where this was really i mean like you know they kind of tell you these things but like i just wonder like were the kids going to school like were they you know what did he just leave them in a, in a place where people frequented it just says school kids found her so i'm assuming they were walking home wow or walking to school. Imagine your kids stumbling upon such a thing. Yeah, I mean, that probably scars you for life. Mm-hmm. But Joanne Connor, she was another one, 16 years old, lived with oh. her mother in Seattle, and on February 4th, 1982, she left for a job and told her mother that she was going to try to sell some campfire mints. She was a high school dropout and hadn't had a job since she was working at McDonald's the previous year. She was found the same day, beaten and strangled. She was thrown out of a car on Fremont Street near the ship canal. When she didn't come home that night, her mother watched the news and saw a body bag being loaded into a van and she just knew that it was her daughter's body. Joanne had no ties to sex work. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. These three murders weren't originally linked to the Green River investigation until later on. All three women did not know each other, and the dump sites were in completely different places. Captain Brooks started looking into criminologists to help solve the case because the numbers were in the double digits now. He coined the term serial killer, so that was his term that he coined, So, like, prior to this, they didn't use the term serial killer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. And in March of 1983, he enlisted special agents of Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI to help with the case. They all agreed with Brooks's theory that there was a multiple murderer who was roaming the streets undetectable by law enforcement. Dick Kraske linked to all the victims together, and he was able to determine that these women were all victims of the Green River Killer. April 1982, Teresa Klein, 27, was last seen alive at Wendy's Pub. She was a beautiful woman who lit up a room and everyone remembered who she was. She had long auburn hair and was meeting her boyfriend who was a professional gambler. She was supposed to meet him later that night. She tried to catch a ride with patrons at Wendy's Pub, but none of them were going that way. So they kind of like shrugged her off and said like, hey, sorry, you're beat. So she told them that she would catch a bus or hitchhike three blocks away to see her boyfriend. At 12.35 a.m., that was the last time anyone saw Teresa. Three hours later, Teresa's body was found in an alley strangled. Three other women were found in different areas, strangled and stabbed. These cases went unsolved. Some made it to the Green River killer victim list, and some didn't. It wasn't unusual for cases like this to remain unsolved because there was... Also a rapist that went by the name of Duke who threatened women and he would threaten them with his Doberman to like do what he said. And he went on a killing spree and there was a lot of unsolved murders that were attributed to other killers during that same time in 1982. Because you got to remember there's like back then they didn't have all that DNA evidence. So anybody that had like these impulses and they could just get away with it and they were going out and killing people left and right. There's a lot of murders that were unsolved back then. Yeah, that's 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 to be sure, especially if you're into watching cold case files and things that they've unearthed since. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it, I think about it just 10 years ago when smartphones, well, 12 years ago when smartphones weren't readily available, all the fun things that we could actually get away with that we can no longer get away with anymore. Exactly. So it was a free for all back then for them. Yeah. The 20th, uh, late 20th century technology to get around with none of the 21st 
century tricks to rat people out. <laughs> was, yeah, uh, right. Mm-hmm. All right, go on. Sorry. Three other women were found in different areas, strangled and stabbed. These cases went <laughs> unsolved. Giselle Lovewarn, 17 years old, had blonde wavy hair that cascaded down her back, and she had freckles. She loved concerts, and her boyfriend, who persuaded her to leave California and go with him to Washington, she had no ties to Seattle. She was just like a transplant. Mm-hmm. Her, her boyfriend, known as Jack Back, had gotten a job as a cab driver, and she was turning tricks. They had their problems, and they were on and off for a time. She went to South Dakota, and he sent her a money order to come back to Seattle. She told her parents that this is the last trip to Seattle before she came home and turned her life around. Jack Beck persuaded her to stay in Seattle with him. He didn't like her turn in tricks and said that eventually their relationship became completely platonic. She left on July 13th to pull three or four tricks after a concert, but never returned that afternoon. She hadn't seen the news or known about the Green River Killer. Jack Beck reported her missing right away, but the police didn't take the case seriously, and they filed the report on July 17th, four days later. Here's another example of some like police officers just not taking it seriously when somebody goes missing because she is a sex worker. Mm -hmm. So they just like overlooked it and they possibly could have, you know, investigated this, maybe found her. But if she she was a victim of the Green River Killer, I doubt that she would have been found alive anyway. But there are situations where people can be if they're reported missing right away. Mm -hmm. This Giselle, I think her name was, a 17-year-old blonde. Her mm-hmm. boyfriend's name you said was Blackjack, right? Oh, that's uh, Giselle Lavorn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what, what I was thinking was interesting. It's Jack is... Back. Yeah, Jack, Jack Back. Jack Back. I was going to say because it was um, the one who was last seen at the Wendy's pub. The 27-year-old's boyfriend was the professional gambler, and I thought it was interesting that she would have a boyfriend named Blackjack, but I got it wrong, so continue. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> My mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So, <laughs> a blind story reported that the police linked two more missing women to the Green River Killer, Giselle Lavorn and Mary Meehan, 18. The police interviewed over 300 people at this time, and they had some suspects, but they were questioned and there was really little evidence to go on. On September 25th, Giselle Lavorn's body was finally found in the brush along the SeaTac airport. She was in advanced stages of decomposition and had many sock tied tightly against her neck. What left investigators baffled was that the Green River Killer killed interracially. Mm -hmm. There was no method of his killings, like there were with Ted Bundy, you know? Mm -hmm. He went for a specific type. Ted Bundy, yeah, he had specific type. This entire time so far, um, you know, at first I was thinking, well, maybe it's mostly sex workers and and young women, and then, you know, there were a few people who weren't sex workers, so um, and then we ended up with somebody in their late 20s as well so it didn't even seem like he had a type not not just a a method but he didn't have a type or a method which is strange well he did he did have a method and he did have a type but it wasn't the type of type it was a sex worker type some of those women he assumed were sex workers that weren't oh okay yeah okay the type was a sex worker and i'll Hmm. tell you about that more later on but why he picked that victim type okay for now we're going to get back to this so ted like i said ted bundy he had victims that had hair parted in the middle they usually had long hair it was usually brown he did have a couple victims that were blonde so it was odd for them to find a serial killer who didn't have a specific type of victim because at the time this whole new serial killer thing was kind of new even though serial killers had been around for a long time people they just came out with behavioral profiles around this time and right. now they I mean, were thanks to thanks to brooks there they actually came out with the uh, phrase serial killer <laughs> yeah exactly like <laughs> so i mean they're they were learning at this time and mm-hmm. and, and those victim profiles were never like really like 100 percent concrete so we're gonna we're gonna hear some crazy shit in a little bit so i'm gonna i'm gonna just keep going here there were victims that weren't sex workers and just hitchhikers he killed latina white and black women they were usually young but some were in their late 20s And because these women traveled a lot and met a lot of strange men, it was hard to narrow down suspects. And, you know, they kind of kept their lives private. Because, I mean, how many people were going around the streets screaming, hey, I'm a sex worker. You know, I just went out with two Johns this afternoon. 
about as often as married women say that they're picking the sex workers up, I'd assume. Yeah, exactly. So he went on a ki- on killing, you know, for a long time because police in the community didn't take it seriously because they thought these women were basically on the outskirts of society. They were coined the less dead. Melvin Foster became a target suspect when police were able to figure out that he had some links to some of the victims. He was a local cab driver and he drove to and from the airport down to the SeaTac Strip. Sometimes he would get sexual favors, you know, like to settle debts from the local sex workers to pay their fare ride. On September 20th, 1982, he was questioned and was asked to submit a polygraph test. He lied on the test, not admitting to knowing the women and later said that he might have known the women. Might. So he he totally changed the story. And Melvin gave investigators permission to search his residence and they announced that they found a suspect. They jumped to a conclusion and it backfired in their face because to their dismay, the search came up with nothing and they were fixating on the wrong person. Barbara Kubik Patton was a private detective psychic who came forward to the police and she said that something drew her to the Green River. She said she heard screaming in the word Opal or Opel and a car speeding away. Police thought her psychic vision must have meant that she was present during the murder or a witness to it. She inserted herself in the investigation and started pestering law enforcement, even going as far as to like record conversations with one suspect, Melvin, the cab driver, and played these tapes for his father. She was adamant on solving Opal's murder and David Reichert was sure that Melvin was the murderer. It really like grinds my gears when I hear about psychics getting involved in murder investigations because half the time they send the police on like some wild ass goose chase and they never like give them like accurate information. I've heard like maybe one or two cases where they actually gave accurate, pretty accurate information, but like it's so far and few in between. It's like if they just stayed out of it and let the police do their job, maybe they wouldn't be so distracted by all the the bullshit. And I, I go to psychics. Don't get me wrong. I like psychics. Shit, I just got my cards read like two weeks ago. Yeah, but this is a situation where you're integrating superstition as well as hearsay. Well, yeah, you know, pretty much. I, That's what I mean. I, yeah, and in a case, this type of situation, you need science. Yeah, you do. Because how can you prove a psychic's visions in a court of law unless it just happens to lead you somewhere that you do find the body? Now, I can understand if you have a cold case at this point and you have no leads, you might listen to the psychic. Well, I mean, if even listening to a psychic, you would still have to collect accurate data. You would still have to have things that can solidify what these superstitions are alleging to. And I and I'm so it, I feel the same exact way. I'm you know I I love the derivative of you know science and spirituality. That's why I love alchemy so much. But I think yeah, in a too. situation like this, you've got to be solid, objective, and oh, yeah. that you absolutely I mean hearsay from a witness is already a little bit malleable and then if you you know well I had hearsay from another realm that you can't tune into but I can tune into and let hearsay this super sit no it's just <laughs> here it's, you say this <laughs> yes, yes exactly exactly it's just too much too much I totally agree with you yeah so the psychic was of no use she was she was useless And she was just kind of pissing off law enforcement at this point. So they were desperate enough to try to get the media to flush the Green River Killer out into the public eye at this point. Because, like, they had no leads. They developed a full profile at this time and suggested the killer was Caucasian in his mid-20s to early 30s. An outdoors man. Not too thin. Not too fat. That he had a hatred for women and especially sex workers because he found them immoral or dirty. He had probably been cheated on and felt scorned by women. I took this excerpt from the book Green River Running Red and it's by Anne Rule and I love Anne Rule. She's not alive anymore, but she wrote some amazing books. And her book on the Green River Killer was absolutely amazing. I mean, she went into such detail. I cut out so much stuff because there was so much information. And if anybody wants to find out any more information about this case, the details that I don't go into, it's still worth a read. I don't know who gets the profits. Maybe if she has children, they get the profits from the book. And that would be amazing if you bought it because it is a really good book. It's really difficult to convert any book into a podcast or a movie. It's never the same, especially with such a prolific body count. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I had to cut a lot out, and um, it kind of blew my mind, like, the amount of information that I had to leave out. But Anne Rule's written many great books, and her other book that's kind of, like, drove her career into true crime, like, really drove it into true crime, was The Stranger Beside Me, which they made a movie about, which sucked, by the way. <laughs> but the book that she wrote was amazing. And it was about her relationship with Ted Bundy and how she like knew him. And while she was writing the book, she's telling him all about this killer that she's writing this book about, but nobody knows who the killer is yet. And she's literally telling him about this and he's the killer. Wow. And it's because they were friends. <laughs> right. And she didn't know she was writing a book about her own friend. Unbelievable. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because I was just saying that, that the book is usually better than the movie as well. We've oh, learned that yeah. with Anne Rice tenfold. Oh, yeah. Anne Rice is the bomb. Mm-hmm. And her movies, are, yeah, they're good, but they're not like her books. No. Not, not None even of the close. movies are ever like the books. Like, the books are always way better than the movies. Because they're like an interpretation of the book, and it's never like... You, you always miss stuff, or they change things, and I hate that. Well, I think that the Green River Killer might not make for a bad series if we didn't want to propagate the nonsense and horrible stuff that he did and give him more notoriety than he already shouldn't have. Yeah, that's why I kind of cut this one down, because I, I really didn't want to give him notoriety and, like, go into too much detail about these girls, because they're underage, and, and I just felt like... You know, as, as a feminist and a mother and a woman, I feel personally offended by what he does. And as a prostitution is one of the oldest professions in the world, so even while it isn't for me or anything like that, it takes two participants, male and female, consensually... And therefore, I don't look down upon it the way that I suppose some people do. Yeah. But I still don't look at somebody as if they're a lesser person because they're doing something like exactly. that. Exactly. Like it, as long as two consensual adults are involved, I will retract that bid regarding anyone under 18 or even 21. I just, I can't imagine full-grown men picking up these 16 and 13-year-old girls that absolutely blows my mind so i feel bad for the girls me too but we got another one we got another one it's going to keep going too and i'm sorry Ugh, these but poor we have girls. another one so we got penny bristow <sighs> and she was finishing work at her minimum wage job on the sea tax strip she was in early pregnancy oh my god yeah and was too tired to walk home she stuck out her thumb to hitchhike and a man picked her up at a truck stop he asked if she was a working girl I'm using air quotes right now. He offered her $20 for oral sex. She wasn't really into that life, but she agreed to do it. She's like, eh, $20 is $20, you know? So she asked him if he was the Green River Killer, and he said no, obviously. <laughs> I mean, he's going to be like, yeah, it's me. I was doing it. I was killing all them women. Now no. get into my car. Yeah, get into my car and just be unassuming and give me a BJ. Mm-hmm. So he drove her to a wooded area to perform the oral sex. Unfortunately, he was unable to get an erection. There comes that ED again. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'm glad he didn't get an erection. I hope his penis falls the fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and that made him furious. I bet it did. His little ego and his little penis were probably like all hurt. What a clown. Yeah, he's a piece of shit. So he accused her of biting his penis and knocked her into the dirt with his fists. He got behind her and wrapped his arm around her neck, squeezing. She struggled and begged him to stop, but he got an even tighter grip and she twisted and tried to fight her way out of his grip. And she got, she got like pretty rough and got out of his grip just long enough to start running through the woods. And she found a, a mobile home that was nearby and started like banging on the door. And his shorts were around his ankles so he was like trying to chase her like you know how you you have toilet paper in the closet and you don't have it on the roll and you start running <laughs> to try to wipe your ass and you got the pants around your ankles well that's pretty much what happened and he tripped and fell on the ground with his fucking ass hanging out like a total loser good so she banged on the door and she's screaming let me in let me in and then when the police arrived at the scene she gave him a description of a white male with brown hair and a mustache Probably the best description, and she's probably the only victim that got away. I mean, there might have been others, I don't know, but she was the only one that went to authorities, because I bet 
I bet there were others, but because they were sex workers, they probably didn't report it. Now, this is just me assuming. This isn't like fact, because I don't know. But I would assume like with the amount of women that he was picking up, that there had to have been more, like maybe his first like attempts. Mm -hmm. But not everybody goes to the police if they have drug problems or if people don't believe them because they're out on the streets. You know, a little separate from the whole psychic idea and something I do like is when they hire an artist to give an interpretation of the witness's perspective of how the person looks. You know, just saying mustache and brown hair seems like, it, you know, it umbrellas a whole bunch of people. But if she were to speak to an artist and have the artist kind of define what she perceived to be his face to the best of her ability, then at least they would have that. Yeah, like a police sketch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know if she had a police sketch done of him at this mm -hmm. point. I'm sure when she gave the description, they probably worked something up. But it'd, I've it'd seen be... some of them police sketches and they're like awful. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, they never I, look no. like the person at all. Yeah, I mean, they could be misleading sometimes, but it's better than just, you know, white, male brown hair and mustache I well mean, he's I, pretty basic he's a total basic bitch so absolutely I would think. that's what i mean he sounds yeah. as basic as could ever be mm. and he's five foot nine to five ten average weight <laughs> yeah i think he was like five to, actually he might have been taller than five ten i can't remember but i think i listed in here so we'll have to find out but yeah but he still sounds basic as shit i still feel like he wasn't that tall like he just looks like a mousy fuck like he, well there you go a great description he looks kind of mousy he is mousy looking. If you see his face, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'll have to show you some pictures after the podcast. So he looks like Bush Jr. He's No, I'm just joking. Go on. No, I don't think he did. But he he just he really did look mousy. So uh, the rest okay. yeah, the rest of nineteen eighty two more bodies were being found and missing persons were piling up. Of these dozens of cases, these women were linked to the Green River killers. I got seven. And then we're gonna talk about more. So in September 26, 1982, Linda Rule, 16 years old, last seen leaving a motel on Aurora Ave heading to a department store to shop for clothing, just disappeared. December 23rd, 1982, Colleen Brockman, 15 years old, found near Sumner in Pierce County. Denise Bush went missing on October 8th, 1982, but her skeletal remains were found in a wooded area in Tukwila. We'll just call it tequila for good measure. Yeah, Tukwila. <laughs> south of Seattle in February of 1990, and her skull was found in June of 1985 in Oregon. So her body was found south of Seattle. That was found in 1990, right? Mm -hmm. Only her skull was found in 1985, so like oh. years before, her skull wow. was found in Oregon. So it seems like he either dumped her head in Oregon and maybe dumped her body in Seattle. So I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll never know, but her body was found in two different states, portions of it. When did this gentleman have time to eat? Like, I don't know, I, man. He had all kinds of stuff going on, and, and you'll find out about that. But, like, I don't know how he did any of the shit that he did. Because, like, really, I can't even find time to, like, edit the podcast and, like, make food for myself and go to work and clean my house. And this motherfucker's out here. I don't know why I just whispered that. This <laughs> I, don't, I was like, maybe I shouldn't curse. It, it just blows my mind that he's out here committing all these murders going home and taking care of his fucking lawn and driving to work and cooking his meals and having time to go fishing and shit and having girlfriends and attending different things which we'll get into and it, it just blows my mind it's like how do you find time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i know um, him having such a busy lifestyle must have made it difficult for them to find him because yeah. I, I mean you're, you're imagining somebody like we're discussing that has a lot of time on their hands and time is such a withering thing I feel I feel right now that you and I are at a point where time feels daunting overwhelmed with the amount of tasks that we're trying to execute at the time and yeah I feel like time just like is so fast when you have things that you have to do and then like whenever you have nothing to do like time seems to go by so slow Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that daunting aspect of it, and then there's the where did it go, and with him, he's just got this, I, this actually blows my mind, these 15, or sorry, 13, 15, 16, 17, all the way to mid-20-year-old women are being found 
all over the place and like this this man it sounds to me like there's more than one person working with him <laughs> i know that's what it sounds like right yeah it really does so in november's 7th 1982 Shirley Cheryl, 18, went missing near Seattle's International District. Her mm-hmm. remains were found in June of 1985 in Tigard, Oregon. Terry Milligan, 16, went missing August 29, 1982, and her remains were found off of Star Lake Road, south of King County, in November of 1983. Deborah Estes, 15, went missing in September of 1982 and was found in May of 1988 in Federal. Shwanda Summers, 17, who went missing in 1982, was found in August of 1983. Dental charts were able to identify her. Her body was found beneath the apple trees, right under the airport flight path. So, like, people are flying over this flight path, like, leaving the airport and coming in, Mm -hmm. and her body's, like, sitting right there under the apple tree. And it wasn't found until a year later. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some continuity there. There have been a few that had severed from body but still weren't discovered until a year or longer hence. Yeah. We have another one. Marie Malvar was a beautiful 18-year-old Filipino woman who turned tricks to get by. Her boyfriend, Richie, used to watch her, and he would note, like, the cars that she would get in and out of because he, like, f- he, you know, he feared for her safety. It was his girlfriend, kind of her pimp, too. They sat and watched as a dark truck approached, and Richie noticed a hint of primer paint on the passenger door. So he followed the car as he usually did and pulled up alongside him. He said Marie looked as if she was in distress and she was like waving her hands around, clearly upset. Mm -hmm. He couldn't hear what she was saying, but said that she looked as if she wanted to get out of the truck. The truck pulled like a Yui, this is what we call it in New Jersey, a Yui, and headed the car around the corner. Richie tried to follow, but was stopped at a light that had turned red. So he caught up to the truck and then noticed that there were no taillights. He followed as the driver drove down a street that he didn't, that didn't have any noticeable turnoffs. Like, and out of nowhere, he just like pulled down an almost hidden cul-de-sac on the right of Military Road. Richie drove back to the parking lot to wait for Marie, but she did never return. Now in Marie's line of work, it was hard for Richie to like go to the police right away because, you know, he was in fear that she might be arrested or he might get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So... Instead, he called her father, Jose. They went reluctantly to the police station and spoke to Bob Fox and told him what had happened. On May 3rd, Richie, Jose, and Marie's brother followed the path from the parking lot down to the cul-de-sac that Marie and the driver turned onto. They went onto the street and spotted a truck parked in a residential driveway with a primer splotch on the passenger door, which is what he saw when the guy picked her up. They immediately called police and questioned the resident of the home. A man, he answers the door in a calm, cool, and collected way, like all not unassuming. He told the police there was no woman in there. There hadn't been a woman in there. And the police were like, okay, sir, have a nice day. And they just left. (laughs) Not knowing that the body of Marie Malvar was in the home already deceased. So they literally pulled up to this motherfucker's front door. And they're like, oh, do you have a dead woman in there? Did you kidnap some woman? He's like, nah, I'm gone. No way. There's no chick in here. Okay, bye. Yeah, and they just like left. And I'm like, he was right there. Like, you guys just fucking dropped the ball. But I, this, I get it. Like, you know, they don't take these these people seriously. This good, or sounds like this good Samaritan. So, of course. Of course they mostly do. Oh, yeah. He's like, oh, he's got a house and a car. And he lives in a suburban neighborhood. We better not bother him with these sex worker problems. Yeah. And it's I, like, it's, come it, on. That's, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. So, at this point, I think we're up to 1983. And there were... 20 more victims in 1983. More than have already been disclosed? Oh, yeah. My goddess. There were 20 more victims in 1983. Now, the police are frustrated, of course, and the task force was spending tons of money, and these cases were growing bigger and bigger by the moment with no resolution. This is the first time you and I have ever discussed such a thing where I've actually lost count. Oh, yeah. Like, you can't remember all these. I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to reference people, I'm going to have to go back because I can't remember them all because there are so many. So when you right. say somebody's name, I'm like, uh, and I have to, like, go all the way back in my notes because I can't. There's, I'll tell you how many people they think he killed later on mm-hmm. and how many he was actually prosecuted for, but it's an insane number. 
and I just you know when we first started talking about Wendy and then we led into the biracial teenager and the two black women and I, I feel like by the time we got to Marie <laughs> I um I absolutely lost lost count and I'm not indifferent to the fact that there are so many Sorry. young women <laughs> that's okay young women's lives lost it it's just I'm trying to imagine investigating and and the bodies becoming statistics instead of single murders that people have the ability to really tune into and, and award attention to I know and they are that's all they become is statistics and it's exactly. really sad Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the episode here and we're going to start back up in 1983 because this is going to be a two-parter. So I'm just going to, I'm going to stop it right here. So I want to thank you guys for listening, but stay tuned for our part, part two. And if you would like to give us any case suggestions or reach out, you can go to, or go to our Facebook page, Rogue and Wicked on Facebook. Um, we have an Instagram, Rogue and Wicked on Instagram. We try to keep it all the same so it makes it easy for you to find us. We got a TikTok. <laughs> and that <laughs> one is also, yeah, <laughs> you got a ticket to the crazy show. And um, <laughs> that one is Rogue and Wicked on TikTok also. All right. I'm interested in coming back to this so that I can learn a little more about this man's profile. Because oh, girl, I'm going to get deep. It's the how that has me the most curious. How the hell did he do? Not just on an ethical and fundamental aspect, because that's fucking its own whole thing, but I'm absolutely baffled that this man was able to do so murders in his in this one short duration of time. Oh yeah, well some of those were, were linked to him, but they weren't actually proven. Thank you guys for listening, and stay tuned for part two.